Hey, I hope everyone's doing well. I greet you, Shabbat Shalom. And I just wanted to talk about something that I've been thinking about for a while. I hear people say, to my late husband said the soon once he said, Oh, I wish I had met you sooner. You know, we could have blah, blah, blah. And I said, no. We met at the right time. And now I know it's all the things that you suffered through made you the man you are today. And everything I suffered through made me the woman I am today, which in turn made us completely designed for one another. And the reason why I bring that up is because a lot of times we see that the blessing doesn't come when we want it to. But we do know that our God is an all-time God. And because it's an on-time God, and a God for all seasons and every tribulation, we need to remember that part of this walk with Christ is waiting on God. We need to wait on God for his blessings. We need not to, um, it's a phrase I came up with, pull a Hagar. And what I mean by pulling a Hagar is that's what Sarah did. See, God promised that Sarah would give her. God promised that Sarah would give him. And God is not a liar. But when Sarah thought about herself, she thought about her age. She thought about the time of life with women. She knew all about her. All about her imperfections. All about the things that would in the physical mind, in our actual thoughts, in our flesh, would prevent us from bearing a child. That's what she thought. That's how we think. We tend to go in because of flesh, because of things we see, and we're like, oh, you know, let me help God. <laughs> see, Sarah only wanted to help God. And by helping God, she delayed the blessing. See, when the Hagar means this, God has said what he said, and he will do what he said. But he never said what time, at what age, in what season he would do what he said he would do. But you have God's promise that God will do everything he said he will do. So I want you to first be encouraged by that. When God gives you a promise, trust. He is completely able and he will perform all he said he will do. But also, remember, you have to wait. Waiting on God sucks. I'm not going to mince words. I'm not going to be like, oh, it's such a wonderful and a bright experience. No, it's hard. It sucks. But it makes you think. There's a thing, uh, with a song that I don't remember the exact title to have to wait back in the 80s, 90s room. And it said, I did not make me, no it is making me, as the very word of God and not the intentions of any man. When God tells you something, when God promises you something, sometimes the reason why you're waiting is because in the waiting, God is making you into the person that when the blessing gets to you, it will actually bless your life. Sometimes we get into the state where we're like, um... You know, we know what we're doing. We know where to go. And, what, you know, we're waiting. And we claim to be waiting on a blessing when we're constantly trying to run ahead of God. If God does not take the time to fully throw you and make sure you're in right standing with him, that blessing will be a curse to you. See, the Bible does say we have not because we ask not. And it also says you have not because you ask on this, meaning you ask things that are out of God's will for your life. You may look at your neighbor. Your neighbor has a house. Your neighbor has a car. Your neighbor has many, many things. And so you say to yourself, well, my neighbor has it. God bless them with it. Why can't I get my own? Why can't I have that big house? Why can't I have that big car? Have you ever stopped to ask God what he really has for you? Not everybody in this life will be rich. Not everybody in this life will know poverty. 
God is a just God. And you can't blame God for the things that you don't understand. You need to ask God for wisdom and understanding. Here's the deal. When things come away, when we look, okay, I'll tell you like this. There's blessings, there's good timing, and then there's the I give up. A lot of people, because they have not been blessed in their time period, that they have given to God. <laughs> Did you hear that? The time period they gave the Almighty God. Then they say, I give up. God doesn't hear. God isn't listening. I don't know where he is. There must not be a God. Those are the people that give up. Because they don't understand that God's timing is not man's timing. A day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Our timing, our physical perception of time is nothing compared to God. So we like, oh, it's many years. I am 43. I've had cerebral palsy from birth. Mind you, I've read in scripture where God healed people faster, even from palsy earlier. But does that mean he has not heard me? Nope. He has a new will. I have God's promise. We didn't want God to be stuck. But it's necessary. And you may look and say, well, I've been waiting on God for the past 20 or so years. And this person, they have been able to come to Christ. And they've been blessed and they've been healed. And they're still running the streets and doing whatever they want to. Can't no mind. That's not for you. That's not about you. Leave it alone. Because, see, God said to reign on the just as well as the unjust. So, you leave that to him. It's in his timing. It's in his hands to do. And you never know. Maybe that person may have ran back to their old life for a season. And maybe that healing will succeed. Place it in them that somebody else will come along the water. And it will still bring forth salvation unto them. We can't say. We're not God. We can't say that by. What really bothers me, though, is people, while you're waiting, will come to you and tell you that the reason you haven't been blessed with so-and-so yet is because you are living in sin. They will tell you it must be your disobedience because you will have friends that are just like the friends of Job. And Job had shitty friends. Let's just call a spade a spade. They were horrible. You can have people in your life just like that. They may be members of your own household. But don't let it get to you. Trust God. Hold fast. All hell may be breaking loose. Everything around you is going wrong. What does God say about that? Romans 8.28 says, All things work together for our good. Trust God. But have you ever thought, <laughs> this is the other thing, like, say, Oh, I want a house. God give me a house. God give me a house. God gives you the house. At whatever time you say, God gives you the house. But at the time God gives you the house, you're not financially stable to take care of it, and you end up losing the house. Whereas if you just waited on the Lord instead of going out, filling out the mortgage, taking out all the things on your own, if you just do what God wants you to do and wait, He will in time promote you to make the house you receive. Easy for you to afford. God is the best provider of all time. Trust Him. I know that it sucks, but one of the fruits of the Spirit is actually long suffering. And we have a joke in my family that our family doesn't need any more long suffering. We need to start going after the other fruits of the Spirit because we have long suffering down pat. We need to start going on love, peace, joy, because long suffering my family knows. But we wait on God. What choice do we have? We do not wish to run ahead of God. We, I can personally speak, I, I have been through so much in my little 43 years. Did I say little 43 years? I know people live longer than me. They've suffered greatly, but still smile. The joy of the Lord is his friend. Never forget that. While you're waiting on God, while you're, while you're listening and you're not hearing, cause it's not that he's not speaking. Sometimes we need to quiet ourselves to be fully able to hear the voice of God because we allow so many things to cloud our minds. 
We all so many things into our heart and wound us. That's why we need to cry out to God daily about our hurts. And when you cry out to God about things that hurt you, and especially people that hurt you, be ready to forgive the people that hurt you. I know it's like, forgive what? Be ready to forgive the people that hurt you. Because as you're crying out to God about your circumstances, remember, Every day you wake up is another day to do right, another day to serve the Lord and Spirit and the truth. And also, you must repent, because as long as you live, you will fall short. You can't wake up one day and say, I'll never sin again. I, I haven't sinned since I received Jesus 23 years ago. Then you lie. You are a liar. See, we mortify our flesh daily. We kill our flesh daily. So that we can live with Christ. We decrease so that he increases. That's what we're supposed to do. But a lot of times, the act of mortifying our flesh is too painful. So we start, but we don't finish. And I know that, because I started and didn't finish because it was too painful. And I had to ask the Lord to show me some things. And to be honest with you, Killing your own flesh hurts because to kill something in you, it has to die. You want it to die. So you don't wound it slightly. You don't tap it. You kill it. You eviscerate it. <laughs> you want this thing out of you and gone from you. Your flesh can cause so many more problems. I mean, I hear people come up, well, it was the devil. It was your flesh. It's not Satan. There's a difference between your flesh and the devil. Does he do bad things, can he? Yes, I, I'm not going to say the devil ain't never been busy. But remember that your flesh rises up. Even in the most fervent believers, every day, every way we can, we need to be mortifying our flesh. And it looks different for everybody. What I came up with, um, maybe I didn't come up with this, but it came to me last night. There's maybe somebody else also thinks it. Don't let your conviction become my condemnation. Once again, do not let your conviction become my condemnation. And what I mean by that is this. You may be walking together, members of the same church, members of the same Bible study, and you may be convicted to do a certain thing, to not watch a certain show or song or whatever. Whatever God has said, you need to stop, and you stop. But you have a brother or sister in the Lord that is still doing this. It doesn't make it wicked. Paul said all things are lawful, but not everything is expedient. When God told you to stop, he did not tell the other person to stop. So the fact that you're convicted, doesn't mean that you should turn around and condemn your brother or sister in the Lord because they're continuing doing something that God personally told you to stop. God personally told you, not that other person. And you ought not to condemn a fellow believer because it also says in scripture that there is no, that there, I'm uh, sorry, that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. If I, and walking after the Spirit alongside you, walking after the Spirit, why condemn? Because God told you to stop. Sometimes we're waiting on the Lord. The Lord will tell us, as he's telling us, let this go. Put this aside. This is not for you. But what he's telling you to do is not for everybody else. And because he's directing you a certain way, does not mean he's directing his other child a certain way. As any good father will tell you, all children are different. He loves them all, but they're all different. So the way that they are pruned, punished, reprimanded, chased, and however you want to put it, is going to be different. But for you to, yes, accept what God told you to turn down and not do, but then to use that to condemn your brother or sister, it's wrong. Does it happen? Yes. Is it wrong? No. But all these things lead us to know that while waiting on God, 
为重复电池。